group by three. Thanks, guys, for having me here. Uh, I was um, I was kind of pretty happy when it was actually selected, and all those who voted for me. Yes, I have to mail you your checks yet, but just give me a few minutes, a few days when I come back from my vacation. So. Um, this is just, uh, I don't know if you have done this already, but yes, at the Boston Seagull Saturday and such also, we do actually um, show this to people. So, and it's actually printed in a big way over there. So that's me. Uh, my name is Paresh Motivala. I'm a Seagull DPA with a company called Navisite. We provide 24 by seven SQL or any sort of database support. Um, round the clock, round the globe. We also in UK to cover Europe and then Middle East, and then we are in Australia and we are in, of course, the USA. 20 plus years of DBA work, um, a lot has changed and then nothing much has changed because everything, it's always the DBA, not the network, sorry guys. And um, I'm on leadership teams for the Boston BI. Uh, the business intelligence user group. We are actually the biggest group there for Microsoft technology. And New England SQL Server user group, which is the oldest SQL Server user group in, I believe, USA. And the DBA virtual group, which is actually formed after PASS as an organization was dissolved. And I'm also running this organization called Circles of Growth, where I teach public speaking, debating and so on. So I actually mentored a few DBAs around the Boston area and getting up and speaking. So that's what I love to do. And yes, uh, in 2020, I actually believe it or not, got my Global Excellence in Photographer Photography Award. And I've got like three prizes in singing too, which I'm not going to be doing today. So rest assured. Uh, or co-sponsors, SolarWinds and Redgate. I've had the pleasure of knowing some of the key people there, especially Grant Ritchie, my dear friend from Boston. He is always there at almost every single event that I've spoken at. So, um, media sponsors again, SolarWinds and Straight Path Solutions, and virtual group sponsors are Pure Storage and Dallas DBAs, and these are all our sponsors once again. So. So what are we gonna be talking about today? So this is not something that I have read in a book and translated it for you here. This is a, most of it is actually based out of a one month project, which means approximately 200 hours worth of projects uh, that went into finding out how we can cut down our maintenance window. And uh, the strange that yes, uh, people, use Ola's script, but I think we should actually have Ola come and talk about Ola's script a lot, actually. Uh, and so by dissecting the script, I was able to actually cut down a lot of what we were doing the other day, uh, just prior to this project. So uh, we'll talk about backups. Uh, we'll talk about how to stagger your backups, why stagger your backups, uh, what are Stripe backups, parallel backups, uh, by using PowerShell, uh, maybe you can restores, uh, you can do Stripe restores, um, snapshot replications. This is not the replication as we know in the database sense, but this is about snapshotting your storage to take backups. So technically you can actually even back up your temp DB, so don't laugh. And then copy data virtualization, so I think in all the backup technologies we have seen, copy data virtualization is the newest. It's still about seven or eight years old. Uh, we'll talk about that and uh, checking your database integrity. That actually takes a lot of your time from your maintenance window. So how do we cut it out, right? That's something we definitely want to talk about. Uh, Re-indexing versus reorging, right? Um, and then updating statistics. Um, what do we do? Why do we do, et cetera, and so on. Uh, also, timing your maintenance is awfully important, and we'll talk about that too. Uh, Third-party job schedulers. Now, I know a lot of us are very deeply married to SQL Server job agent or SQL Server agent. It may not be a bad idea 
to look at a third party job scheduler, especially if you are looking at 100 servers or 200 servers and not just SQL, but it could be your Windows server, it could be your Oracle servers. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to use the word Oracle here, but MongoDB server, whatever you're doing, you don't have to have jobs designed on individual servers. And I have actually had the pleasure of using one of them. So uh, let's talk about that. Um, and always like anything else we do in life, um, especially in IT, go ahead and keep on reassessing whatever you do. So, and how do you reassess? Well, attend conferences like these and learn about new products, new services, and new features within your existing products that are available. Okay, Pura, shut up. Can you actually start talking? Yes, I will. So more importantly is if you are in a conference, as soon as it opens up and you are in person in a conference, spend some time with the sponsors. I am not kidding you. One of their products, one of their services, or the feature from their existing products can actually change your life completely. So definitely, if um, if you are there, visit your sponsors, and that's why I can never thank the sponsors enough with what I do. So, uh, and then yes, of course, like a great presenter, I always give plenty of opportunities for you to go ahead and ask questions, right? And I hope. I have answers for you. So far, I haven't received ever on this particular topic a single suggestion, which is kind of a bummer because I would love to improve and make it better all the time. But it has been, this is the 20th time I think I'm doing this presentation now. So please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. So let's talk about backups and why stagger the backups, for example. So Staggering the backup means, you know, you can have, say, for example, you have 10 databases. The first one is three terabytes. The smallest one is 100 gigabytes. You can actually group your databases in such a way that you can have some start at one o'clock, some start at two o'clock. That's one way. Other way you can do is have a full backup on weekend and differential backups during the weekdays. But then remember, come Friday or Saturday, your differential will be just as big as your full backup. So uh, timing and staggering your backups, awfully important. Uh, why? Why is it important though? Because what happens is that no matter what you do in terms of your backup, they all get written to the same SAN subsystem that you have unless you have a separate SAN that has been given to you by your beloved uh, SAN administrator, the chances are you're writing everything to the same thing. So by spreading your writing window over a longer period of time, you'll do a lot uh, of favor to yourself and your company. So then Stripe backups. This is something that I have actually spent almost a month. And then again, I did the same about six months ago with another customer of mine and we were actually able to cut down our backup window from 15 hours in the first case to about two hours. Uh, I think I have these statistics for you too. And in this latest one that I did, the database was about eight terabytes and it now finishes in about 90 minutes. So striping your backups, absolutely important. The earlier one was the three terabytes, sorry, not a 15 terabyte database, my bad. And it still took a long time. So, but when it was compressed, it was 280 gigabytes. Um, of course, because you're a database guy, uh, you know, the steps and all the company, the backup window, the backup rates are almost always five. They never give you a faster performing backup drive because backups are not important. Um, so this is what, is actual statistics of what we did. Now, I would not only look at the CPU, which is of course important, but look at the power of the machine. It was only four cores and had eight gigabytes. Uh, when I did eight stripes, it was taking 97% of the CPU, which means 
for all practical purposes, that SQL Server was dead for anybody else. Uh, but look at the IO column there. 630 to 650, five years ago, that was not a very happy place to be in because if this is taking up your space, uh, 634 IO, just imagine you are now becoming the noisy neighbor that all the SQL Server tuning experts will always talk to you about because the other VM on your system is going fine, but the IO is really hurting you. So we messed around with uh, block sizes, with max transfer sizes and so on. Uh, and buffer count, actually, just by changing the buffer count, we were able to really enjoy the 70% CPU only at the time. But mind you, this was just a four cores. Um, so for us at that point in time, having a four stripes uh, backup was the happiest medium we could do. But still, instead of 14 hours, it was still finishing in less than two hours, which is kind of awesome. So this was the other one. So we then started messing up with the um, uh, come on. more parameters. And then we started looking at the weight types that go with it also. And again, uh, with a higher uh, power system also, we found that we were able to do it in a much uh, faster way uh, and CPU friendly way with the four stripe system. So <clears throat> this all looks same, it does. So for a 16 core and 64 gigabyte RAM, which of course you don't have to worry, but this was actually production and an eight stripe CPU uh, backup took about 65% CPU, which was still not bad at the time. But the maximum IO that we got out of it in that environment was 310. Now, are these really relevant to you right now? What figures we had at that point in time, does it really matter to you? Not really. But the reason why we made these columns here is if you are going to do this today in your production environment or your test environments, please, please, please go ahead and measure these. So some of this, for example, the one for four stripes is missing here. Um, I haven't recorded it, but recently what we did, uh, we found out that in our current environment for an eight terabyte database, the eight file backup was the happiest. We did not see tremendous spike in the CPU because mind you, the CPUs are now five years younger too. So uh, do measure these. These are extremely crucial. Now, why should I worry about IO MBPS other than the fact that yes, you will become a noisy neighbor and it will piss a lot of your customers off, uh, including your internal customers, of course. So you want to take your storage admin into confidence. The, all the horror stories you hear about DBAs and developers, DBAs and storage admins, they're not really horror stories. They actually do happen, right? So if you take them into confidence that, hey, you know what, I'm going to try this today. Can you go ahead and monitor these for me in the background? And if you see something alarming, tell me right away, okay? So although I haven't me, got it here. Yeah, go Interrupt ahead. you with a very quick question from sure. Peter. So Peter's question is, what would you recommend to configure stripes and max transfer size if you have TDE enabled for the databases and SQL version is greater than 2016? Very okay, so question. excellent. So the one that I did recently is SQL 2016. We did have the max transfer size of 4194304. Uh, we did not change the black uh, block size or the buffer count from anything that was default in Ola script. And I would say, although I recommend this, please do try. Uh, buffer count actually is a real bummer. Uh, it can actually almost completely bring down your system. I'm generally surprised why we even have that here, but 
please do try that. I would say definitely max transfer size was the best option for, and our database that I'm working on right now is TDE enabled. And uh, yes, we were actually able to go ahead and get a lot of work out of it because we were able to change the max transfer size. So please do use max transfer size. Uh, block size, um, I would just keep it at max, like 65536, five, and you live happily ever after. I hope that answers your question. If not, feel free to ask it again in any different shape or form. So, All right, thank uh, you. Cool. Now, I wanted to show you this, right? Okay, so this eventually, in a smaller machine, we found out that a force type backup again, finished in about two hours, CPU was 70%, and IO MBPS was 336. This made my storage admin very happy. Correct. And now we'll go to the restores part of it. We got a question specific to backup coming up. Um, so how much memory does backup require outside the buffer pool? So non-pooled memory. Okay. So I do not have the exact answer for that. Can I take this question down? Can you be able, can you actually go ahead and send it to me? I will definitely yes. research that. And I promise I'll, if not during my vacation, shortly after my vacation, I will definitely go ahead and do it for you. Thank you. So, um, now, parallel backups, right? So uh, multiple SQL jobs, how do we handle that? Or can this be portable? Uh, what do you mean by portable? So let's just look at this. So instead of creating two jobs, um, it makes, if like this one customer that I was talking to you about that I worked on recently with an H stripe backup. Uh, we are having approximately 6,400 jobs on that server. 6,400 jobs, and I'm not kidding you. So making it portable, yes, you can actually always make it portable, but still you have to do that. And that is my bigger worry about this. But yes, you can have uh, run multiple SQL jobs. Uh, you can run them in parallel. Again, keep your storage admin uh, in confidence when you're running it in parallel. Uh, and also check the capacity of your NIC because if you are copying your backups to the local drive, trust me, I have had two mega failures which have actually wiped out the uh, CIO of an organization because they chose to store the database backups on the same server. And in October, 2019, we lost that server's two drives. The way the SAN was configured, we lost the backup, we lost the database, we lost almost everything that was there. It took them four months to rebuild that data warehouse. Okay, just so you guys know. <clears throat> so check uh, and that is why you always have your backups not stored locally but off to a nas i would strongly recommend uh, do go ahead and look up uh, different products that are available for you to do that. Use PowerShell. Uh, this, there's a lovely article in msqltips.com uh, on doing parallel backups with PowerShell. Uh, I haven't tried this, okay? So just please be aware of that. So, And this is the one we did on Stripe Restore. Actually, I'm sorry what happened to Stripe. Slide should have been one slide earlier. Please excuse me on that. But in the Stripe Restore, as you can see, how we measured with the help of the storage admin, latency one, latency two, and overall latency, and for what duration the latency lasted. So as you can see with this four one, it was, the latency was 36 milliseconds. So we selected that. In two, somehow it was 2173 milliseconds. In eight, it was 370. It was all over the place, but it is important for you to do this when you are messing around with your storage okay and uh, we have one more question and backup more general backup question 
Sure. Um, so if you have a full backup started and it has not completed yet, if the if a differential or a lock backup job, job starts, what happens to that differential or lock backup job? What would that actually um, set off of? If that makes sense. Hmm. So we've had uh, log backups go. I've never actually had the situation where a differential actually ran into um, a full backup. But differential backups, say, for example, if they run for 15, 20 minutes, and if you're running logs every five minutes, yes, we have never had that job die on us ever. Um, unless there's something else going on in the system, uh, I haven't really come across that scenario, really, except that if you're uh, the only thing that I have never really actively observed is a differential backup running into a full backup. I haven't seen that to make a comment, but uh, our transaction log backups run every five minutes. And I know that those five minutes run right through the day even while the differential backup is running. So, uh, <clears throat> and the full backup also runs for one and a half hour, but the transaction log backups still run every five minutes. So if that answers your question, if not, please do let me know. Uh, so remember, try to be as methodical as I have been over here with uh, latency, how long the latency lasted and so on. So you can let your manager or even higher ups make more informed decisions about what they want to do. So, <clears throat> okay, so database integrity checks. This is one of the stupidest things that I used to do. And yes, I did that several times. We ran database integrity checkups like everybody else does. And you should, because that's your life on the line there. Uh, why is that such a big problem? Because you would have noticed that DBCC checks actually do tend to run into your performance and so on. And it does interfere with a lot of other things that you're doing. So what would you do then? So would you run it on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, right? Uh, again, like a classic all DB answers are, depends. Uh, in my earlier job, when we had only a hundred gigabyte database, we could actually afford to run on a daily basis. Uh, and it was a slightly poorer, IT company in the time, so we couldn't do what I'm going to suggest next, okay? So against which database should I run my database integrity checks, correct? Right? So most of us will say, of course, Prash, what's wrong with you? You have to do it against production database. But yes, I agree. You have to do it against the production database, but does it have to be in production? Two subtle differences, right? You have production database here. Take a copy of that, restore it onto another server and run your DBCC checks on that database. You have to go back and run that in production only if this one is bad. How often does that happen? Once in five years. So for that once in five years event, why would you cut down that extra uh, create that extra work for your production database server. So just keep that in mind. So, uh, and please keep the word reporting in mind because the next uh, topic will cover that too. So snapshot replication is what I was telling you earlier about. This is a huge, huge development uh, over the past, uh, I would say about eight or 10 years, uh, people are no longer working on full-blown database backups and restores anymore. They take snapshots of your disk on which the system is, uh, your database is residing, and it quiesces the database server for a split second. It doesn't kill anything, and I'm telling you this with 100% confidence. For a split second, it stops your SQL server, takes the picture of your entire bitmap of your database subsystem and it goes ahead and stores it as a snapshot replication. So you can do that almost daily. 
uh, or you can have a user-defined timeline. The only problem is that you are dependent on your infra team to do that, which means that you have to keep on buying a bottle of single malt every freaking week or something like that. And I don't like that. So just so you know, it takes less than five minutes. So a hundred terabyte database, you want to back up. Currently, it might take you 24 hours maybe uh, with conventional backup techniques uh, like native SQL even with eight stripe or 16 stripes or whatever it is. Whereas with the snapshot replication, no matter how big your database is, your backup time is less than five minutes. Yes, I repeat, it is less than five minutes. So if, and the VMware or your storage, uh, which comes from EMC or any other uh, platform that you buy it from, they have this feature where you can actually take a snapshot application. So if you are not already doing this, please explore the possibility of doing this with your storage people. It will actually change your life a lot, okay? So now what has happened is just look at what I'm saying here, okay? You cut down your backup window. You cut down your DBCC check window because you are running it against a replicated copy, which mostly comes out of your snapshot replication or the next topic that we will cover shortly, right? Uh, snapshot replications. The other thing you want to keep in mind is that just it takes five minutes or less to back it up. And it takes just about the same time to restore a hundred terabyte database. That is five minutes, okay? So that is why snapshot replications are increasing uh, in their adaptation uh, by the IT community that support the database servers. Uh, <clears throat> again, we have two more this. questions. Oh boy, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> you have to tell me at some point um, if you're getting into time trouble, so I start queuing questions. So that's still completely- No, 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 no. I think we should be fine right then. So first question is, um, do you recommend running DBCC check DB on system databases? Um, we're running it against all databases right now. Okay. Because I have seen real bad things happen. Like the server that I was talking to you about two years ago when I was working at another company here, um, we lost our master database, but not MSDB. So if that really helps you. So I would definitely okay. check that. And um, is there a way to um, create a snapshot while you're running DBCC check DB? Um, from if it can, I haven't actually had this happen to us before because we run DBCC on a different database now. Um, so what I would suggest is, yes, you should be able to run it because remember, even the OLTP transactions are going on in the background. So if they can survive, the snapshot replication, this will survive. If you are doing it, please go ahead and tweet your answers back to me that if you ran into a problem or not, but I would definitely go ahead and do a little more research from my side also. And I promise I can get back to you guys sometime after my application is over, so. Is snapshot replication at storage level transactionally consistent? Um, Generally, yes. I mean, I have seen nothing that has actually had to be rolled back or anything like that. So, and you, you can actually see that in your SQL Server logs that the database server was quiesced for a second. So whatever happens, happens. So it has never actually destroyed any of my transactions yet. I can promise you that. So uh, if you're still skeptical, wait for my next slide, okay? Uh, and you'll see a lot of these questions getting actually answered. So does that make sense? So yes, in a way, I haven't actually seen any transaction being destroyed because I took a snapshot application. So cool. And then with the snapshot replication, one of the biggest questions that we don't have to worry about is which server am I going to be doing this on? Right? So now what you can do is you can actually take a hundred terabyte database and restore it to a system that has four gigabyte RAM and four cores because the storage 
is actually portable and it is taking you only five minutes to adapt it. You can, for crying out loud, you can actually do it on your own laptop. Uh, sometimes I'll tell you why in the next slide. Okay. So, <clears throat> so the next slide that I want to talk about is copy data virtualization. So, um, what some vendors did, uh, you know, like Actifio and Rubrik and Cohesity, and they did is that they took the snapshot replication and defined a very lovely GUI around it, where now everything that you needed your infra team for is now you can do something on your own. The developer can take a backup of 100 terabyte database on his own. Um, he can restore a 100 terabyte database on his own. And I think you are already thinking, oh, gee, Presh, are you sure you want to give database backup and restore ability to a developer? Damn, you know what they did to me last time? Yes, they have screwed up hundreds of databases, but with copy data virtualization, you should not have any problem at all, okay? In fact, a lot of what you're doing, because you can imagine on a Friday evening, it's like 4.59 p.m. and your manager of the development team comes and says, hey, Presh, I want to, I want you to restore this five terabyte database because we have a release coming up on Sunday. Of course, something they knew six months ago, but they wouldn't tell you because you're a DBA. And you like begrudgingly go ahead, set it up, pack it up. By the time you go home, it says seven o'clock or so, the backup is completed. You go ahead uh, because you don't have a life, you don't have a family because you're a DBA. You will go ahead and now restore the databases for them. And at 11 o'clock, he will call again. Hey, Presh, these guys actually totally effed up the database because he forgot to highlight the where clause in the delete statement. So he has deleted everything that was there. So can you do the same thing all over again? So wait at 11 o'clock, Instead of being in a bar and drinking, uh, you are actually restoring databases. So now that is taken care of with this copy data virtualization techniques that are available now. So now, <clears throat> copy data virtualizations, uh, most of these work in a way that you have a first full ingest, which is the full backup as we know. The rest of them, even if you take a full backup, uh, it is just an incremental backup. So what is an incremental backup? It is the blocks of data that have changed on your storage system. And that is all that is actually copied over, okay? So, and thus you can actually have a transactional consistency using this too. So if that also actually answers your earlier question about transactional consistency with snapshot application, copy data virtualization is nothing but actually giving you that uh, flexibility. Uh, Good part. Yes, Presh, of course, this is not coming at a cheap thing, right? Yeah, yes, this does cost money. I will not kid you at all. Okay. So some people charge you by the size of the data that you are protecting. Some people will do it by the hardware they sell you and so on. But the important part here is the restores. The restores based on copy data virtualization are, as the word suggests, they are virtual in nature. So you can actually give 10 people in your development team their own 100 terabyte database in five minutes. So can you imagine the happiness that there prevails in your development team? But more importantly, you're now able to turn around your products that much faster because you have the ability to do testing on the same database uh, or the database footprint as we would call. Now, one of the, when I was working at Actifio as a SQL uh, architect uh, for them, we had an organization from uh, Southern part of USA, which had about 110 terabyte database, which has not been backed up in eight years, okay? It has not been backed up in eight years because they just don't have the, ability to buy that kind of storage or the downtime and et cetera, et cetera, the things that go along with it. So they invited this company, uh, Actifio, to conduct this for them. They gave us two months to carry out this full backup. And they said, if you can do this, then you are you have this business. So we sat down with them. We understood exactly what it was. <clears throat> and guess what? <clears throat> Sorry, guys. 
we were able to complete the ingestion in less than 50 hours. Now we could actually go ahead and give the developers 100 terabyte database at literally no extra cost. The, the idea being that when they did any development, they would only take a backup or an extract of that small or the large table, which would be like one terabyte, and then restore it to another system and just develop based on that table. So the footprint of the database is used across the development and QA team was always very different. So no matter what they did, uh, one day after any production release was put into picture, uh, they would have to either roll back or have a patch that had to go in because this database uh, scripts and anything else pertaining to a database was never really tested against a full-blown database at any given point in time. So <clears throat> uh, you can give simultaneous copies. Uh, again, all the 10 would also take you only exactly five minutes. So, um, And again, with the snapshot application as in copy data virtualization, the question, which server do I restore it to is not relevant anymore. <clears throat> but the core difference between the snapshot replication and a copy data virtualization type of technology is that this is user driven and that is big. So you don't want to be called a DBA because you are restoring a 100 terabyte database on a Friday evening. Instead, let the people go and do that themselves. So, so timing, right? Staggered re-indexing, for example. Um, now, I'm assuming that you have a reporting environment where you are doing a nightly restore from a production copy or you have a snapshot replication. So what I would do is, you know, the one of the common things that Microsoft or Ola have us run is, okay, if your index is 30% or more, then you rebuild, less than 30%, you reorg, just to run that script to find out which index is at 30% or more takes a very long time, right? So what I would do is, I started running that script against the copy of the production database come Sunday, and then I would find out, okay, these are the indexes that have been scattered or fragmented by such and such percent. You keep on building those index lists, so to speak, and put it in a table somewhere, right? And when you are doing the re-indexing, you can actually, if you have the benefit of time, then you can go ahead and do it every night. I don't give I mean, you know, there's a crap about it, but sometimes you can only do it during the weekend. In that case, uh, if you can break down the indexes that are fragmented, you will avoid running that two or three hour script that finds out which data uh, indexes are fragmented and such. So, uh, and then based on whatever you have, you can have like five indexes rebuilt today, five indexes rebuilt tomorrow, and so on. Again, it depends, right? How you want to do it. If you have the luxury, go ahead and do it. Right, blah, blah, blah. You know this, stagger or the DAs or the weekend, right? Um, rebuild statistics, uh, after you have done the rebuild of the indexes, don't waste time rebuilding statistics. I used to do this blindly because it was available in SQL Server maintenance plan. And I thought I was doing my company a huge favor by doing this. The, if you remember, I gave you the case study of the eight terabyte database that I just told you we finished now in one and a half hours. Just rebuilding the statistics on one of the largest table is currently taking us 14 hours. Um, I tried something different a couple of weeks back. I listed all the statistics that are there on the table. I split them into two parts and ran them simultaneously in two different jobs, okay? Uh, 50 statistics here, 50 statistics here. So, and they still took approximately the same time. So if anybody has 
a way of rebuilding the statistics faster. Let me know. For some reason, I cannot use a 2% or a 50% sample size. I have to use 100% sample size in this particular case. So, <clears throat> Tim has um, a quick question for you. Yes, Tim, go ahead. Has re-indexing ever solved a performance problem for you? Oh, yeah. Hands down. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised you have that question because I have actually seen several times that whenever we run into the say for Monday morning or Tuesday morning, uh, we find out that there's something stuck up in a transaction. We find out that, okay, let me check if my re-indexing job actually did complete successfully on Sunday night. And eight times out of 10, I have found out that no, it did not. And then based on the query, we look at the indexes that it is actually touching. I would go ahead and just selectively reorg those indexes, which takes significantly lesser time. But yes, it has actually. Um, I don't know if it was meant in a sarcasm, but yes, it has definitely helped me a lot. In fact, a lot. So I would definitely, and unless you have a specific thing that a case study that you have come across where it has not helped you, please share that with me. I will share my Twitter handle again with you. Can if you are. If you need, I can even share my email address later. Okay, cool. I, does that answer the question? Can you check, please? It looks like it. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, uh, do uh, turn on the feature. But Tim file has one quick yeah. follow up. Um, is that yeah. because of fragmentation, or is it more likely because the rebuild also updates statistics? Um, aha. Actually, um, I would say that it definitely go by index, uh, the answer by index. I have not yet had to separate those two to do that case study. Uh, but this is the first time that I have had so much interactivity. So I'm so happy that you guys are asking these questions. I do not have a 100% answer on this, but from what I have done, that yes, it has really helped me uh, just do away with the re-indexing part of it. Uh, I'm not sure if it is because it also updates the statistics, but uh, uh, there are times when we are just running update statistics on a daily basis because the tables are too large. But if the indexes themselves are fragmented, uh, you have a problem. And you can actually see this in display. Uh, take a copy of your production databases uh, just prior to the re-indexing and try to run a query against that one. Uh, try doing first an update statistics, destroy the database, you know, do it with uh, reorg, destroy the database, and then time it with the rebuild. And you will see uh, that if you are stuck uh, because the indexing was not completed, reorging might actually help you uh, temporarily get over a lot of the hump there. So I hope that answers your question. Cool. Thank you. Cool. And uh, yes, instant file initialization is actually great. Uh, please make sure that you have turned it on on your SQL Server. Uh, and cleaning up after yourself. Um, one of the nastiest things that I have seen happen, and there's one particular customer that I was talking to you about where we are benchmarking the 8 terabyte database backup. We found backups that are there since 2015 and the developer doesn't want to let go of it. So what is happening is that sometimes even to run the DBCC, you would have noticed that the DBCC creates a snapshot also on the same drives. And now guess what? You don't have space on your drive, so the DBCC may not complete either. So just watch out for these kind of things. Always clean up after yourself. Um, your boss will worship you. Even if he doesn't give you any raise, he will definitely give you a lot of praise for doing this. Um, there is a whole article from SQL Shack on this. I would definitely recommend that you read that. Um, I have actually tremendously benefited from this one here. So. Third party job schedulers. Uh, I don't know, how are we doing on time? Oh, we have time. So no worries there. Uh, you don't require programming skills, uh, flow and error handling is 
superb. Actually, it is absolutely incredible. Um, even DBS can use it and it interacts with everything, not just SQL Server. You may have a Windows job. So what you can actually do here in this case is uh, using the third-party job scheduler. You can actually have a SQL job that kicks off a PowerShell job on a Windows thing. Or for example, if you want to fail over your server or the AG group, you can actually do that all in that one single thing. Uh, you have uh, SFTP tasks to be done. You can actually go ahead and add it to this particular thing too. So the important part of this one here is that it saves you a lot of time and money, but more importantly, you don't have to worry about it yourself, right? Somebody else is already handling it for you. So this is one more thing that is going off your plate and you think, oh, Presh, you're here to replace me. And no, it's not that. You can actually do better things, okay? like learn about Azure, do more work in the cloud, because in the cloud you don't do, in some cases, right? A lot of the stuff that you do as a DBA, you don't do. So this will help you save a lot of time for yourself too. Uh, it has more actually uh, extended logging. You don't have to go to five different places to correlate your logs to find out what actually happened. This all comes up in that one single log that you have, which is kind of cool. Uh, and as you can see, you can eliminate human errors. The spelling here is intentional. It's not that my English is bad. Uh, and yes, it helps you automate a lot of good stuff. So cool. You want to check this out sometime because this will be available for you to download, right? And you see this, the backup script crashed 751 days ago. This is what happened with our customer because they did not ever back up. And in my own organization, where the company did not give us a separate NAS to back up our production database. So please do not live on the edge. Okay. Planning and reassessing, look for changes in the environment yourself, right? Um, has your need changed? Has your business requirements changed? That is important because certainly sometimes I used to do once an hour transaction log backup over a period of three or four years, that changed to every 15 minutes. So just keep on top of that. And always look at newer technologies. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Talk to your sponsors. Uh, they can change your life. And that we are the people who bring to you the newer technologies. So, um, and yes, if you get an email from a vendor, don't just discard it. It as oh yeah, this is just another email that I got. At least look over it in five seconds and see if it makes any relevance to your day-to-day -day job. If it can make your life better, this is a good way to do it. So now the newer technologies downstream, upstream, right? So what you are doing does it affect people downstream? If there is a newer technology available. Can you change your upstream process that can make your life better and your database is more reliable? Your company can be 100% confident what you're doing. So, okay. Do this. Uh, DBA Data Warehouse. Um, I don't know if a lot of people are actually using this technology, but I thought there was a feature available in Microsoft uh, SQL Server 2 where you could do this. But record the size of your backups because a lot of people insist that MSDB, all the job history should be deleted after 100 days and so on. I am not a big fan of it, but record the size of the backups, the time it took for the backups, time it took for re-indexing the databases, no matter which server it is on, right? Uh, growth of the disk consumption, uh, the growth of the databases that happen, the versions of SQL Server. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that you can actually do in your DBA data warehouse. In fact, the customer for which I did that first benchmarking of the database backups, we also did a process for uh, what they call as a key point indicators where they had no real method where they could show their customers, their insurance companies, that their servers were up 0.9999 time. Uh, the four nines that are required in some cases, right? Uh, 
but with the help of this kind of information, uh, the data DBA with data warehouse, I was actually able to prove it to them that no, they were actually not compliant with their insurance requirement. Um, is it good, bad? Yeah, well, they have at least that this now a knowledge for them. So they're not hunting in dark, so to speak, right? So uh, <clears throat> with the help of that, you can actually go ahead every time your SQL server is brought down or brought up, make sure that you record that event ID in this database. So any event ID which is associated with a server coming up, but does not have a matching server down event ID, that means that the server actually crashed, okay? So you can actually then give at the end of the month a full blown statistic about how it is going. But more importantly, by recording the size and the time of the backups, you can actually go ahead and plan for storage because you will see how difficult it is to get some storage out of your storage admin. Oh, I gave you 500 gigabytes yesterday as if it is their own father's property, but it is not. So now you can actually show, hey, wait, what are you talking about? Look at the growth of the databases that have been happening over the past. So, so you can actually do this in a very nice graphical way. So. Okay. Speaking of um, the storage admins, um, have you ever experienced silent data corruption in a database, like data storage from a lot from a data loss from storage that was previously committed? And if so, um, how have you resolved that situation? No, we have never actually had that problem. Uh, we've had Lucky corruption you. in other ways. We have uh, disk level corruption in other ways. If that, the only way we could do this is go back to the. Uh, previous backup or run a DBCC and see if we can repair it. If we cannot repair it without data loss, then can we do it with data loss, which is almost never okay. But in certain business cases, you can actually go ahead and even find out the page level corruption and you can just restore that one specific page. But in terms of maintenance, I have never actually had to add the displeasure of facing that if that answers the question. I think so. Okay. But I think of all the questions, this is 100% my most favorite question. Thank you, whoever was asking this. Uh, that's really huge. Thank you for checking. So let's summarize, right? We spoke about backups. We talked about staggering your backups, not running your backups like as a serial thing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all going at the same time. Take some backups now full backups, differential backups, transaction log backups, snapshot applications, uh, Stripe backups, parallel backups with PowerShell. I shared you the MS SQL tips uh, link also there. Uh, restores, uh, definitely Stripe restores, uh, awesome way to help. By the way, I was, this eight terabyte database that I'm working on right now, we actually had the pleasure of restoring this Stripe restore to a local non, I don't know how to say this, but we did actually restore that eight Stripe backup. It, it took us a reasonably short time. Uh, this was just so that we could prove that still snapshot replication is the easiest way to go. So. Uh, snapshot replication, we spoke about the risk level uh, snapshots that are happening these days, and a lot of people continue to do that. I have yet to find any corrupted transaction because of that. Uh, I, I'm very happy to say that, that I'm sure you know people like EMC and other disk vendors are very cognizant of that, and they would have definitely taken care of it, and yes, they have. Uh, copy data virtualization we spoke. So if there's nothing you can take home today other than striping your backups is to see if there's any ways within your organization you can use copy data virtualization. Uh, it will completely change the way you think of backups and restores. Um, and yes, it will let you enjoy your Friday evenings as well. <clears throat> Then checking database integrities, um, you can use a snapshot replication or a virtual data, a virtual database uh, copy. Um, 
and then you know it can save you a lot of times on uh, running that against the live production database. Uh, Reindexing as against reorging, rebuilding, or just updating statistics. Uh, there are certain databases currently that I can only have the luxury of updating the statistics on a daily basis. Um, there's certain places where we do only reorganizing the indexes because now we have almost a comprehensive list of indexes that are consistently fragmented over the week. So we don't have to run that query which finds out which indexes are 30% or more fragmented. And uh, even though we have the comprehensive list, we still run that query, but against a copy of the production database, if that makes sense. So uh, timing your maintenance, uh, very crucial. Um, a bad maintenance plan is what I call as a resume regenerating event. Um, people have lost their jobs because they did not do proper maintenance on the databases, whether it be backup, uh, index check, index rebuilding, or even just DBCC. <clears throat> if you can research third-party job schedulers, uh, I know as DBAs, we find it extremely tough to relinquish control, but there are times when you have to, right? So I would say go ahead and work on better things like performance tuning. Uh, go ahead and learn about Azure and such. Um, that'll change your job and your life for better. So. Uh, planning Speaking of third-party yeah, tools, right. um, so Sai has actually two questions. So what are your thoughts right. on backup solutions like Veeam, um, which are overtaking the standard SQL Server backup and transaction log backups just for organizational awareness purposes? And Good. in addition to that, what are the possibilities of backups getting corrupted using these tools? Uh, I have never run across a situation where the job um, has corrupted a backup itself or the database, um, we are using Veeam actually, sadly, more and more uh, regularly, um, and people are enjoying it. Somehow also, I mean, this can possibly warrant a much larger discussion, but there's somewhere a CIO who just likes to buy a product, despite knowing that this is already available here. So if you already have a snapshot replication, right, why would you go ahead and buy an expensive software like Veeam, for example? Um, but hey, you know, we implemented one more solution to the organization that didn't really need it. So uh, it's, it's, it's a much larger discussion, but yes, I have an organization that just recently implemented Veeam. And as it turned out, they did not inform the DBA team about it and uh, we suddenly found out that the Veeam backups were somehow ending up on the same drive as the actual backup and every day now the job started failing because there is no space and they said fresh but your jobs are your backup is running at two o'clock and five o'clock full backups um, there is another company that is running six to twelve full backups of all their databases daily because they have that continuous delivery thing where I always tell them, hmm, have you ever actually looked at Redgate tools or something like that, which actually help you in the continuous delivery uh, instead of, so they have given their developers the SA privilege to run a full backup in the middle of the day, just because they are running, uh, they're implementing a script. So as against taking the transaction log backup, why would you even let them do it? Because transaction logs happen even if you don't take them before your script is run. So I don't know, but effectively, Sai, I hope this answers your question. Veeam has been a great addition to a lot of my customers. And currently I am the primary DBA for about 10 customers and a secondary for another 10. And I can tell you this with 100% confidence that these third-party products, yes, they are freaking expensive, um, but yes, they do work. So, And uh, I don't know if you guys are aware, but there's a term called as the airplane effect. 
And that is what happened with a lot of the CIOs, CTOs who are flying in the planes and they come across those magazines where they pick up this word, hey, copy data virtualization or Veeam, and then they will make the entire organization run after that single product, right? Whether you need it or not. So what they're saying is, hey, I have a great solution now. Can you build up a problem around this solution? Uh, just watch out for that. It's unfortunate, but it does happen in a lot of organizations. So, and you have to put up with it, so. But yes, Veeam has really helped a lot of my customers, so if that, Answer your question. Cool. Anything else? So, um, if in you have theory, yes, but um, ahead. that stuff we can queue till the end. So, um, keep going. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, I keep this slide here always. Um, you love this. I love Dilbert. Everything that is Dilbert. So, I hope you guys enjoy this. Uh, this is my contact information. That's Circles of Growth. Please feel free to reach out to me if you want to ever learn about public speaking or debating. A lot of my students, mostly children, uh, I've taught about 550 plus now, and I enjoy doing, I will enjoy working with children. My mission in life is to enable people to get up and speak. So if you are a DBA and you want to do a presentation and you want to run it by me, I don't charge you for that. I'll do it free for you because that's my way of giving it back to the database community. And this is not a commercial. I actually do it in a lot of cases. So uh, if you are going to connect with me on LinkedIn, please do refer to where you met me or I will not connect um, because you just get too many of these. So I think that should be it from my side, folks. Uh, group I thanks you for uh, taking time to attend this um, conference and I can never thank them enough for actually giving me the opportunity to speak and present and share my findings with you anytime. And here's my offer to the group by people too. If you want me to be involved in your planning stages also, I would love to be doing that because I have now planned and implemented so many SQL Saturdays. I take immense pleasure and pride in being able to do that again and again and again. So.